Home Group. My name is Rick Renner, and we are very happy that you've joined us tonight. And I'm here with Denise. Hi, sweetheart. Hi, Rick. And I'm also very, very happy to be with you. Why are you happy? Because I love our home group. I love our home group. And I love that we study the word together and that they respond on chat and that we're getting testimonies. I just love it because and, God's presence is here. And by the way, we really want you to chat with us. And when we're through tonight, Denise and I are going to run down and read the chats. It's very important to us to hear your feedback and to know who's, who's with us. Tell us where you're from. Uh, tell us what country you're from. People come from all over the world. And it's, a, it's amazing, isn't it, Joel? It is. I think that 70 countries, 70 countries around the world have joined to watch us. And that is just amazing to me. You know, Jesus said where two or three of you are gathered together. Well, we, here we are. So, mm -hmm. And our cameramen are here and our director is here. So we know that Jesus is here. But I like to read the Bible with you guys at this home group because... I don't think most a lot of kids have the opportunity to have home group with their parents. <laughs> but that's why I like to do it. So really? Dig down, get in the Word, read the Bible together. I think that's fun. So we love it. And your comments are so encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to finish saying that Jesus is also with you. You know, if He is where two or three are gathered together, then think how many people are gathered together tonight. And Jesus is right there with you, and he's going to pull us together tonight through the Word of God, like Joel said. And boy, we have some, we're going to start a new series tonight. What is it going to be? I'm going to start teaching the first two chapters of the book of Revelation. Not the first three, but the first two. Because I've only written a book about the first two. I haven't got to chapter three yet. So we're going to start the first two chapters of the book of Revelation, and it is going to be really good. It will be. I'm excited about if it. If you've written two books about the first two chapters. <laughs> were, were they just little little small books? Uh, we'll talk about it. I, then you have a lot actually, to say. I haven't, I haven't, my second book didn't cover all of. Chapter two? I haven't covered all of chapter two, but we'll, we'll get back to that in just a minute. But let's, <laughs> let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity that we can be together on home group. We thank you for every person that's connected with us tonight and that the presence of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit is here and is there. And Lord, tonight we pray that you would minister to our hearts, that you would educate us concerning the Word of God and concerning the church. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Denise, I know you want to say something first. Well, I just wanted to just share with you again about who stole Cinderella and... Who stole Cinderella? Who stole her? Who stole her? <gasps> well, actually, sometimes life does. And that's what this is about. And, and the power that we wives have in building our homes. And this is a very encouraging book. I got one testimony that this, the girl, she, she was engaged and she got married and she loved the book so much she took it on her honeymoon and was reading it to her husband. Can you imagine? I guess she got really encouraged. But it is it is very encouraging. It is filled with the Word of God. And I've read it four times. Well, Rick, you wrote an amazing foreword to it. Thank you. Well, I decided that if I was going to write the foreword, I had to really read it and see if I believed it. Well, what do you think? I think it's a great book, and I think even men would be benefited from reading it. Well, I especially just felt that I needed to encourage you if you knew somebody who was getting married or you're getting married or maybe you're not married but you just want to understand more about your role as a wife this is really something i think mothers should teach their daughters but a lot of times mothers don't have time and and um i mean my mother didn't teach me these things and i, I wish she had because i think i would have done better but it's for you, and Rick's going to tell you how you can get it. I also want to tell you about Sparkling Gems from the Greek, and I think you probably already have it. But as you know, it is 365 Greek word studies for every day of the year to sharpen your understanding of God's Word. And 
it is just loaded with Greek word studies. And the reason that I'm telling you about this is I think you already have it. If you don't have it, I'll tell you how you can get it. But I'm writing number two, and this is number two. And in the last week and a half, I have written 80 gems. That's now, 160 maybe. Not, a gem is a whole day. That's like 160 pages. Yeah, it's like a, it's close to 200 pages actually. That's wow. amazing, Rick. I mean, you know, it took me two years to write this. <laughs> two years, you know, teaching these classes for three years, and you write these pages in two weeks. Well, it has just flown out of me, and I just <laughs> praise the Lord for it. There's a lot of word in me, and but the reason I'm ask, telling you about this is because I have a prayer request. I want you to pray for me that I can finish November is finished. All I have to let left to write is December. And I've made a decision that I'm going to commit the whole month of December to the subject of Christmas. And I want to tell the other part of the story of Christmas. This part of the story that people never talk about. You know, Christmas and Easter, I grew up thinking, is there anything else to know than just the cross and the resurrection or just baby in the manger and the three wise men? I mean, is there any more to the story? And there is so much to the story. So I'm going to devote the whole month of December to the story of Christmas, to things that you have never heard before. Who were the wise men? Where did they come from? What was the value of the gifts that they brought? What about that star? What was that star? Was it an angel? Was it a star? going to cover all kinds of things and I mean this is a lot of writing and I'm I'm telling you this because I'm requesting prayer as I begin to write the month of December and I need your help and you can order any of our books I'm not through okay then I'm going to be teaching tonight from these books and so I want to tell you about them and then I'll tell you how you can order I'm going to be teaching from A Light in Darkness. I'm going to be reading from it. This is on Revelation chapter 1, and it deals with Patmos, Ephesus, and Smyrna. And then there is the second volume. This is what I had. This one, I meant we have a lot to talk about tonight. Volume number two is called No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. Now, if you don't have weights at home to lift, you can buy these books and you can read them and you can then lift them because they're they're pretty heavy books but they're really outstanding and Joel I'm going to give that one to you just to hold okay. it move out of the way because I'm going to be reading from this one tonight but this volume number one is called A Light in Darkness and all of these books you can get at renner.org and so you can go there right now and order renner.org and you can get these books but tonight I want you to grab your Bible and I'm going to be reading a little bit tonight from A Light in Darkness. Then in the next week's program, I'm going to be using the whiteboard. And we're going to, we're going to have a lot of fun in this series. And I don't know how many weeks it's going to last. We're just going to go until we're done. How's that? Sounds great. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to begin in verse 1. And we're going to start with a correction. Most people call this the book of... Revelation. Revelations. Oh, mine says Revelation. It's called the Revelation. But when most people say, oh, I was reading the book of Revelations, it's not Revelations, it's the Revelation. That's the name of the book. And the title is found in the opening statement of verse 1, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the primary revelation. So it's not the book of Revelations. There are many revelations, but it is called the revelation. It was one experience. It was one revelation all given at one time. And the word revelation is the Greek word apokalupsis. Now, Maxime, my assistant who's studying Greek, he's here. So, Maxime, I want you to listen real careful to this Greek because you're, you're going to learn a lot tonight. Apokalupsis. Apokalupsis. <laughs> and it is a compound word. The word apo, which means away, and the word kalupsis, which means to veil something or to cover something. If something is covered, it is kalupsis. You can't see it. It's there, 
but you can't see it. For instance, if I put, had a piece of drapery and I put it over Denise, well, Denise would be there, but we wouldn't be able to see Denise. All we would see is just the drapery. But Oppo, if I removed the drapery, then we could see what had been there all along. Now, if I removed the drapery, did Denise just suddenly appear? No, we just removed what was hindering our view of her. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So the word revelation means to remove the veil so you can see what's there. So when the Bible talks about the revelation of Jesus Christ, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Jesus that we see in Revelation chapter 1 is not a new Jesus. He's got fire in his eyes. He's got stars in his hands. He's got a sword from his mouth. You say, well, we never saw him like that when he was on the earth. That's because that side of him was veiled. That part of him was never revealed, the word revelation, apocalypsis, until the book of Revelation was given to John on the Isle of Patmos. Mm -hmm. So it was a revelation to show us a part of Jesus that no one had ever seen before. Not new, it just a revealed part. Is that clear? So it's the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. It's the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. And in fact, if you talk to theologians, this book is called the apocalypsis. That's, that's what they call it. But notice what it says at the very end of verse 1. It says in the beginning of verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must come to pass. At the very end it says, unto his servant, what does it say? John. Everybody say John. 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 God's servant John. God's servant John. Then if you would go to verse 4, and it says, what does it say? John. To John, the seven churches. To the seven churches which are in Asia. But that's the second time in four verses that it has given the name John. So you have the name John in verse 1. You have the name John in verse 4. And then when you go to verse 9, it says what? I, I John. John. It doesn't just say John. It says your I, brother. John. I, John. The word I is the word ego, which is really draws emphasis to himself. It's me. It's John. Now, this was very important because all of the other apostles were dead by this time. Even the apostle Paul was dead by this time. Paul was beheaded in the year 67 in the city of Rome. Um, John, John was the only surviving apostle. And I want to tonight just take a few minutes. I thought it might be interesting to hear what happened to the apostles. What do you think of that? I think that would be very exciting. It would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I think it would be educational just to hear what happened to the apostles. So here I am using my book tonight, this article called What Happened to the Other Apostles. I think it's very encouraging. Okay, James, the brother of John. So we have John who's writing the book of Revelation, but he had a brother whose name was? James. James. And he was killed in the year 44 and he was beheaded. Now I'm just going to tell you what happened to these other apostles. And their stories are amazing because they were living in a world that was very limited. Travel uh, was by foot, it was by the back of an animal, or it was by a chariot, or it was by ship, or it was by some kind of contraption that rolled on four wheels. Um, travel was very difficult. And when you hear where these apostles went and what they did with their lives, it is amazing. Jesus took simple men, and these simple men literally traversed the world of the day. Isn't that amazing? But James was beheaded in Jerusalem. And then you have Andrew. Well, what about Andrew? Andrew was really a traveling preacher, believe me. He went to modern-day Kazakhstan, Russia, eastern Ukraine. He went to the northern Caucasus, including Azerbaijan and Georgia. He was in another part of Ukraine, Belarus, Poland. Uh, he was in the Baltic region. He was in Bulgaria. He was in the Danube area. He traveled and traveled and traveled. This one man in his life. Mm -hmm. oh. And he was crucified. And Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. 
uh, which is a very miserable kind of a death, and it was a very prolonged crucifixion where he hung there for days and days. Where did and he die? He died in the year 60 during the reign of Nero. It, where did he die, though? He died in uh, but the city of Petraeus, what is located in Achaia. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? It is. Oh, it's just amazing. He took the gospel to Cappadocia, Galatia, Bithynia, Byzantium, Macedonia, Thessaly, Achaia, Scythia. It, it's just amazing. And it's amazing that we know where they went. Then you have Bartholomew. And tradition says that Bartholomew took the gospel to Armenia. Hmm. Hmm. And he was killed there. And he was beheaded, filleted, crucified, and skinned alive. All of those things were done to him simultaneously. It wasn't just enough to kill him. They tortured him when they killed him. Then there was James, the son of Alphaeus. We know not as much about his martyrdom, but we do know that he preached throughout Israel before traveling to Egypt, where tradition says that he was killed by pagans. Then tradition tells us that Jude who was also known as Thaddeus, not Jude, the brother of Jesus, but Jude, who was also known as Thaddeus, traveled to preach the gospel in Judea, Samaria, Eudumea, Samaria, Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq, Libya, and was accompanied by Simon the Zealot. And the two also traveled together to what today is known as Persia or, or Iran, and it's believed that Jude was bludgeoned to death by pagans uh, either in Syria or Persia in the year 65 A.D. Isn't that amazing that we know all this information? Very amazing. I'm telling you, it, it's just amazing to me, and it's, it's amazing to me what is in this book. This book is just loaded with information. And what about Matthew? Well, the Bible tells us, according to, um, I mean, early tradition tells us that Matthew took the gospel in Hebrew, uh, to Ethiopia and to the Caspian Sea, to Persia, Macedonia, Syria. And really there's very little known about his martyrdom, but it is suggested that Matthew's death occurred in Ethiopia and that he was killed on the orders of the king of the Ethiopia while he was worshiping. Uh, he was believed that he was burned, stoned, and beheaded. And of course, Matthew is remembered for the gospel of Matthew. Matthew. Then there is Matthias. Now, who is Matthias? Do you remember who Matthias is? Who is Matthias, Denise? It's the one they cast lots for. He took the place of Judas Iscariot. And history tells us that he died in, probably in Ethiopia, maybe in Jerusalem, uh, another traveler. Traveled and traveled and traveled. Then we have Peter. Peter was crucified upside down in the city of Rome. And it's very interesting to me that Peter and Paul were buried for a number of years side by side. Isn't I didn't that, know that. Isn't that something? Yeah, I, I could take you to the place in the city of Rome. It was written uh, in the early centuries that their trophies or their gravestones were side by side. And you can go to the place where for a limited number of years they were buried side by side. I say it's a picture of the law and grace in mm. death. <laughs> Isn't that something? It mm. is fun. The, the Jew and the Gentile, they were buried side by side. But any, he, Peter was crucified. Who died first? Peter. Oh, Peter. Peter. Then we have Philip. And when Philip began his traveling ministry, he took the gospel to Fergia which is a region which today is known as Central Turkey. Mm. And he died in Hierapolis. And it wasn't just so long ago that they affirmed the place where he is buried. And Philip was killed with um, at least one of his daughters, one tradition says with several of his daughters. And do you remember what the Bible says about his daughters? That they were prophets. That they were prophetesses. And so he was killed there in Hierapolis. And today you can go to Hierapolis in Turkey and you can see the site where he is buried. Then there was Thomas. Do you know where Thomas took the gospel? What he's famous for the gospel? In India. He took the gospel to India. And <clears throat> because of a long held tradition that Thomas brought the gospel to the Karelia area of India, a territory located near the 
Indian Western Coast it was confirmed by early writings of early church writers. And afterwards, he traveled even further to the eastern coast of India. And tradition says that Thomas was killed near the city of Madras, where he was speared to death. And so we know what happened to Thomas. Thomas took the gospel to India. He also preached in, on his way in what is known as Iraq and Iran. And then we have Simon, Simon the Zealot. And tradition states that he was sawn in half. It's a horrible, horrible kind of a death. Yes. Do you want me to tell you how they do it? No. No. All right, you can read about it in volume two. I talk about sawing in half. I, I, Joel, would you hold that book up one more time? In this book, volume number two, I actually go through different kinds of Roman uh, persecution, Roman execution, and the things which early believers suffered. One of them was sawing people in half. And sawing people in half is a tradition so old that the Bible tells us that that's how Isaiah, Isaiah died. Isaiah was sawn in half. Did you know that, Denise? Mm -mm. I did not know that. <coughs> so, anyway, <coughs> Simon <coughs> preached in the Black Sea area. He preached in Egypt, Northern Africa, even Britain. He's joined Jude in taking the message to Persia, which is also, which was uh, ancient Armenia. And the two, both of them were martyred there. But pr pretty amazing. I just think this information is just amazing. And of course, I'm just reading little highlights that's written here in this article called What Happened to the Other Apostles. Now notice what apostle we didn't read about. John. We didn't read about John. Because he is, I mean, the other, the book, the book's revelation of John. John was not martyred. But he's listed as a martyr. Now why in the world is he listed as a martyr if he did not die the death of a martyr? Well, they tried to martyr him. Because they tried to martyr him. And here's what happened to John, and it's all right here in this book. And, um, well, I really want you to have this book. <clears throat> if you don't have it, Light and Darkness, Volume 1. John lived in Ephesus. Now, tomorrow we're going to talk about the seven churches and the, lo um, not tomorrow, but next week, and we're going to talk about the locations of the seven churches and how the seven churches were all connected. But John lived in Ephesus. Now, until the year 67, everybody say 67. 67. Mm -hmm. Until the year 67, the Apostle Paul was the apostle and the overseer of Asia. Apostle and the overseer of Asia. Of Asia. He started the church of Ephesus. There was a great revival in Ephesus. And Paul was the overseer of that region until he was beheaded in the city of Rome. <laughs> and Somewhere about that time, we're not exactly sure if it was a little bit before that or exactly the year 67, but somewhere around that time, John moved to the city of Ephesus with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, if you remember whenever Jesus was dying, he looked at John and said to John, behold your mother. Do you remember that, Denise? Mm-hmm. And in that moment, he gave the care of his mother into John's <coughs> hands. And for the rest of John's life, as long as Mary was alive, John took care of Mary. And so where John went, Mary went. John was the overseer. He was the personal caretaker of Mary. So John moved to the city of Ephesus and became the overseer of what today is called Turkey because Paul was dead. There needed to be an apostle who was the overseer of that region. And John became the overseer of that region. And he lived just outside the city of Ephesus on top of a hill. Now just imagine, here's the temple of Artemis. The temple of Artemis uh, was one of the seven wonders of the world. 
It was a wicked, wicked place where there were 6,000 priests and priestess who served 24 hours a day. There was eerie music. There was smoke billowing out of the temple. And just above the temple of Artemis was a little hill. The city of Ephesus was over here. And the temple of Artemis was a little bit outside the city. It was a sanctuary that sat by itself. And there was a little hill just above the temple of Artemis. John did not live in Ephesus. Life would have been too dangerous in Ephesus. Timothy lived there, and there was a church in Ephesus. But John was such a visible Christian leader, he couldn't live in the city of Ephesus. Other Christian leaders would have difficulty coming to see him because they could be arrested. It would have just brought too much attention. So John located to a place where he wouldn't be paid much attention to. And he lived on top of the hill just behind the temple of Artemis. So from where John lived, he could see the smoke billowing up from the temple of Artemis. He could hear the eerie music going up from the temple of Artemis. And from where John lived on the hilltop, he could also hear the sound of the crowds roaring in the stadium over in Ephesus as Christians were fighting lions and gladiators. John had quite a view from where he was. But it, it, that's an interesting thing to me because people say, oh, well, you know, if you live where there's a cult or if you live where there's witchcraft, you know, you're going to have a really hard time ministering because it's so spiritually dark. Well, there couldn't have been a darker place to live than where John lived. It doesn't sound like it. I mean, he lived on the hilltop right above the Temple of Artemis. He could hear that eerie music and see that smoke billowing out into the sky every single day, and that's where he lived in a very small Christian community. Very small. And Christian leaders could come from all over Asia to see him there. And the Roman authorities basically left him alone because they were stuck behind the Temple of Artemis. They weren't bothering anybody. They were out in the sticks, you might kind of say. <coughs> they weren't disturbing the city. And people would come and privately they would scale the mountain behind the temple of Artemis and they would visit with John who by this time was already elderly. Now Mary lived way over on the other side of town on top of a mountain. And it's very interesting that you can still go to all these places and maybe one of these days we need to take a tour and take people to all these sites. But that's where John lived. And we don't know how it happened, uh, but John was arrested. And it's possible that John came into the city, walked past the statue of Domitian, who was the emperor at that time, and didn't tip his head. You were supposed to tip your head in deference or in worship. We don't, we don't know what happened. But for some reason, John was arrested. And John was brought to the city of Rome, where Domitian himself wanted to execute the last living apostle of Jesus Christ. All the rest of them were already dead by this time. That's why this book says, John, John, I, John. John's drawing attention to the fact that it's really him. He's the last living apostle. Is Mary still alive? By no, Mary was gone by this time. Okay. And so John was brought to the city of Rome where he was told to reject his faith and John said no. And so Domitian ordered that John be boiled in oil. Now, boiling in oil was a horrible thing. I, I, it, it's in that book. Joel, hold that book up one more time. I talk about how they boiled in oil. And they killed a lot of Christians, especially notable Christians, in terrible ways because they wanted to make them examples to other Christians. They wanted to use their deaths in order to scare Christians and the Christians would go back to the pagan temples. And they would crucify people. That was a terrible thing to do. They would skin people alive. That was a horrible thing to do. Then they would take their skin and use it as to make furniture out of it. Uh, they would fillet pe people. They would fry people. I mean, literally big skillets, like a skillet on the stove, except this was a huge iron grid and they would fry people alive or they would boil people. And when you boiled an individual, 
Um, is this interesting? Well, it's well, a little I, not interesting. Well, <laughs> I'm, th I'm thinking, you know, that this is what they did, and this and is real. And this is real, and they and didn't, and they didn't compromise. They didn't compromise. They didn't compromise, and but but Jesus said, if you are persecuted for my sake, great is your reward. Well, and there are people who are being beheaded right now for their uh, faith. And they're getting a great reward for their, for their persecution. Well, I want to tell you how they boiled people because it will show the miracle of John's deliverance. Okay. When they boiled an individual, it was just awful what they did. It was a big vat of oil, and they would heat it up. And are you ready for this? They would lower <coughs> you and they would <coughs> boil one part of you at a time. So they would start with your feet and then they would slowly lower you so you could feel yourself being boiled until finally you were completely dipped into the oil and you were completely consumed and you were boiled. And so John was boiled. And when they finished the process of boiling John, they drug a big hook through the oil in order to pull up his bones because what happens when you boil a chicken? The meat falls off the bones. So usually, you know, the boiling process is totally finished. You drag a hook through it, you pull up the remains. It's usually a skeleton or it's bones. But John was on the hook and John was alive and he was not boiled. <laughs> he was not hurt at all. He came out of that oil untouched. And this was in Rome? This was in the city of Rome. And it scared the Emperor Domitian so bad that he said, get this man away from me. Send him to the Isle of... Patmos. Patmos. Everybody say Patmos. 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 <coughs> and so John was sent to the Isle of Patmos. First he went back to the city of Ephesus. And then from Ephesus he was put onto a ship with other prisoners. And there were two kinds of prisoners. There were political prisoners, and then there were criminals. John would have been a political prisoner. The criminals were hoarded together, and they were kept in a group. But if you were a political prisoner, it's all right here. If you were a political prisoner, then you were just released off of the ship to roam the island. Well, there was a problem with Patmos. Patmos during previous periods had been totally raped of all of its trees, of all of its natural resources. Um, there was only one little tiny, tiny source of fresh water on the Isle of Patmos. And many people would just die of malnutrition because there was nothing to eat. There was no place to live. And history tells us that John traveled there with his associate. His associate who was not arrested but who willfully went there on his own. And do you remember what his name was? Prochorus. Prochorus. And Prochorus was one of the first disciples, uh, one of the first deacons chosen in Acts chapter 6. And he became the personal assistant to <coughs> John. And just like Luke traveled with <coughs> Paul, Prochorus traveled with John. So when John went to prison, Prochorus said, I'm going with you. And he boarded that ship, and the two of them together found a cave. Now, th th this, is what, this is what's amazing to me. The cave, which I've been there m many times, the cave was located, are you ready for this? On the top of a mountain, under the temple of Artemis on the Isle of Patmos. <laughs> Now think about it. In Ephesus, he lived on a mountain on above the temple of Artemis. On Patmos, he lived under the temple of Artemis. On it's a mountain. On, on an island. Yeah. It's like he couldn't get away from the temp temple of Artemis everywhere he went. And it was in that cave that John received the revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which we call the book of Revelation. Revelation. Now, that's why John is listed as a martyr. But he outlived Domitian. Domitian died. 
And when Domitian died, <coughs> John was released from <coughs> exile. And history tells us, and there's a lot of history on Patmos, there's a monastery there where you can go and you can read 1,600 years of history. There's so much documentation on Patmos. And while John was there, he started a congregation. There were people living on Patmos who had been exiled there, and he had a major confrontation with a magician, a major demonstration of the power of God, started a congregation, and early tradition tells us that whenever John left Patmos, that there was a group of believers who went to the beach and bid him farewell as he got back on the boat and sailed back to Ephesus. Ephesus. How old was he? He was probably 92, 94. Wow. You know, Rick, I just love that because no crushing power, no threatening of being uh, boiled in oil and then being boiled in oil or or exiled to a terrible island. I mean, everything to steal, kill, destroy a 92-year-old man. And but even it. But what was inside of him was so great that he was still moving in that power and people were still hearing the gospel, being delivered, getting saved, getting healed right there. That's just so powerful of what we contain on the inside of us. It was John who wrote, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And he wrote that after he had been on the Isle of Patmos. Praise God. I mean, John really had a right to talk about being an overcomer. Hallelujah. Joel? I think so. (laughs) How long did he live on the island of Patmos? Uh, John was on the Isle of Patmos for 18 months. And so Domitian must have died. Domitian died. Not not long after. John was released. And he went back to the city of Ephesus where he moved back into his house on the hilltop and he continued his apostolic ministry and he lived to be a very old man and I mean he was already an old man but he can he was not slow he was still doing his ministry and he just picked up his ministry and continued he was the last living of the first apostles of Jesus Christ so his voice was very important yeah So when John writes the book of Revelation, notice he says three times, John, John. He knows he's the last living apostle. Finally, he says, it's me, I, John. It's really me. And this must have been such an encouragement for believers who were suffering such horrible persecution all over the Roman Empire at that time. And they hadn't heard from John for a long time. John had been in the middle of of the sea. He had been he'd been Rome. He had been on Patmos. Uh, People didn't even know if John was alive or dead and suddenly they received this uh, very long epistle this revelation where it says John, John, me. It's really me. It's me, John. I, John. And then John begins to describe himself and I'm going to save that for the whiteboard when we come back next week. Mm. You know, Rick, I You didn't say it, but you know, when some people were crucified, the power of God was on them and they were singing. I mean, I've heard you say this before. And and I'm just pointing that out because you talked about a lot of terrible deaths and and I just wanted to bring an encouraging word because that God's power, he says that he will, uh, um, his power will come when we're at that moment and because we're giving glory to God when we're being persecuted for the gospel we're giving glory to God and his his power comes and I know I don't know which book it's in but you've talked about before that when they crucified believers and was it Nero or Domitian they all did it yeah and and they I'll say Nero and Nero heard those believers outside of his great palace singing and giving glory to God that it 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 just drove him crazy and let's save that for the next program okay all right I'd, I'd, I'd like to stop right there okay thank you I'm just reading Revelation 1 verse 2 
And I like how it says, John faithful re faithfully reported the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, everything he saw. I just like that he faithfully reported mm. the word of God. I love that too, Now, I just, we only have just a few seconds left. Do you know how long the book of Revelation was written after the resurrection? How, ma how many years it had been since John last saw Jesus? 60. 60 years. Everybody say 60 years. 60 years. 60. So for 60 years, John had remembered Jesus. He remembered the touch of Jesus. He remembered the eyes. John was so impacted by Jesus that he called himself the disciple. Beloved. Who Jesus loved. He was very, he was the youngest of all the, of all the original apostles. And it had been 60 years. So finally when he sees Jesus, he has a revelation of Jesus and he sees, he sees the part of Jesus that he's never seen before. And it's interesting that the voice is the same. And when Jesus reaches out and touches John, John feels the same touch that he had felt so many times. But so much in this revelation was a new revelation for him. The veil had been removed and now John was going to see things that he had never seen before. Time's up. This has been great. It really has. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here, Joel. Thank you for being here, Denise. And we want to thank you, Home Group, for being with us. And when we come back next week, we're going to start exactly right here where we're going to continue talking about Revelation chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 9. Rick, I have a word of knowledge. There's somebody right now, and you're watching, and, and the power of God is on your eyes right now. To heal your eyes. I don't know if it's a bump on your eyes, but it's something on your eyes that's not supposed to be there. And right now, the power of God is on you. I speak healing to you right now in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next week. By the way, we're going to go read your chat. We love you.